Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our YouTube channel today. And uh, we hope that you are doing well. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, most everybody in our church is on the mend. Uh, those who were uh, critical are doing much better. And it uh, seems like every, everyone is coming out of the COVID thing okay. Want to let you know that next Sunday, we plan to start back with our in-person services. And we'll have Sunday school and a morning worship service. I uh, don't know about Sunday night yet, but we'll let you know this week. Uh, today, we're going to have an encore presentation by uh, Brent Carr, uh, who was with us for our homecoming services. I hope you enjoyed him last week, and you'll get to see him again today. Looking forward to seeing everyone back as soon as we can get back together, and we'll let you know. I work there at in North Augusta on staff. I went to the Bible college there and was on staff for 10 years. And uh, that's where I met my wife. And uh, thank God, I believe that God is real because somebody as pretty as that married somebody as ugly as I am. Uh, but some of the best memories I have is, is getting in a bus and coming over to churches like this and watching my preacher preach. And he's still my pastor. And uh, Parkinson's has taken hold of him, uh, but I love him, and uh, I'm honored, humbled, uh, and feel inadequate this morning to be able to be a part of this meeting uh, where he normally would be. And uh, I, I, I love him, and he's invested in my life, and I'm honored that you'd have my family. I appreciate you, preacher. Uh, you can take your Bibles this morning. You can go anywhere. It's all good. Somebody say amen. amen. I want you to go with me to a New Testament book, 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. If you'll go with me this morning, 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. I told them in the Sunday school hour, I saw all these tables this morning when I walked in. I thought, we having dinner on the ground. Amen. Uh, and then I found out that y'all already ate all the food last night. And so I'm a little bitter this morning. You pray for me. Uh, the Baptist motto is where we meet, we eat. I take that literal. The Bible, a lot of people trying to lose weight. The Bible says that God's people will be fat and flourishing. Anytime you're reading the Bible about people being thin and lean, it means sin and sickness and disease. But the Bible said God's people will be fat and flourishing. I don't know about you, but I take the Bible literal. Amen. Uh, I, I love it. I, I thought I was going to smell fried chicken in here this morning, but maybe we'll find somewhere down the road. Maybe Burger King will get to eat there this morning. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, I love you. I appreciate you having my family. And, uh, and I don't know where my two little girls are. Uh, I hope they're still in church this morning. Uh, but they're somewhere around here. and They'll be running around in a little while. But thank you for loving on my family like you have. And I'm excited about being a part of this meeting. 1 Thessalonians 4, are you there? Say amen. amen. Uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse number, this very familiar piece of scripture. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 16, and uh, we'll go through 18. Follow along with me if you will. The Bible says in verse 16 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I want to stop right there and say, I'm glad it's the Lord coming back for me. It's not going to be an angel. Gabriel's not coming back for me. But Jesus himself is going to split the skies one day. How many of you are ready for that day? I'll be honest with you. I'm going to have me a good time. I like this hooping crowd over here. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind it. It wouldn't bother me, and I wouldn't be mad if he came back today. The Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, watch this, with a shout. I, I'll stop and say this, and I'll keep reading. If he's coming back with a shout, maybe some of us ought to shout a little while getting ready for him to come. It's all right to say amen. It's all right to worship. It's all right with a loud voice to praise his name. He's coming back with a shout. The Bible said, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. How many of you got loved ones that have died in the Lord? Wave at me this morning. 
I, I watched as the pictures went across the screens, and I thought, how many tears were shed over those lives? How many times have we visited cemeteries? And how many times has a, a wife went home to an empty house and only to go into a bedroom that used to occupy a marriage and a family and a home, and now she goes home and she's by herself? I, I think how troubling it is and how death seems so dark in this day and age. But all those people on that screen, I, I didn't come to talk about the bad. I want to tell you something good and encourage you. All those pictures, that's not the end of their story. For the dead in Christ are going to get up. Boy, I love to be in a cemetery when Jesus comes back and the ground starts shaking. I like to see the face of a funeral director when he realizes he's going to have to give up the money and put a refund in for all the people that he's buried. I, I'm looking forward to the day when the dead in Christ rise first. My wife, her uh, mother died to cancer just seven days before our wedding. We had a funeral and a wedding in one week and I remember seeing the tears fall off her face but I want to tell you cancer will not have the last story in Carol Hurt's life. I buried a sister at 26 years of age but that's not the end of her story for when Jesus comes back oh I'm about to have a fit all the wrongs that have been done here all the tears that have been shed here heaven is going to fix that all <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have me a fit this week. I can already tell it. I hope y'all move them tables quick. I'm going to run a lap. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Cancer had one part of their story. Difficulty and death had one chapter of their story. But God is the author and finisher. And he's not finished with them yet. The Bible said, not only will the dead in Christ rise first, but then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible goes on and says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I want to say this morning, it is a comfort to know, especially in the year 2020, I have taken comfort in knowing that no matter what happens here, there's something going on above us. There's something going on in a world that's beyond us that is so much more important. And that is our final destination. Hey, uh, this problem problem that we see in 2020 is not our final place. It's not our final destination. But God's got a home on the other side. Hey, I've got a mansion on the other side. And it don't have a mortgage coupon book. Somebody say amen. I'm thankful that this world, I'm about to have a fit, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Listen, child of God, God is coming back real soon. Wherefore, because of those things, comfort yourselves one another. We ought to be talking more about heaven than we are about this world. We ought to be talking about what's going on above us, boy. We often get our minds and our focus so preoccupied on everything taking place around us that we forget about what God is doing above us. <laughs> I'm glad that he will not forsake his own, but one day he's coming back to take us to heaven. With that being said, I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you are getting ready to leave this place? How many of you, you already have everything in order and you're ready to leave this place? Where's my wife at? She ain't in here? With my wife in here, come here, bring me that bag. We, uh, we travel about 40, 48 weeks out of the year, except for in 2020. <laughs> 2020, the evangelist uh, found out that he was homeless and unemployed. That's what evangeliz evangelism is in government shutdowns. They shut churches down, and so we wasn't having a lot. We had about, I believe we're up to 
18 weeks. There was a meeting last week that was canceled because of COVID. And so 18 weeks this year, we, we had cancellations. But on a normal year for the last eight, nine years, we have uh, been traveling 48, 47 weeks out of the year. So I know a little bit about traveling. We often will go to, uh, if we're not traveling in our car or our bus, We'll fly out of Atlanta. We usually take trips to places like Chicago and do meetings there. And out in Texas and San Antonio, we've done meetings there. One year, we were scheduled to fly out to San Antonio, and we went to Atlanta. And I was sitting there, and we were in a delay for about two hours. And uh, God started preaching to me in the middle of that airport. Now, you've been sitting in an airport, especially Atlanta airport, way too long when God starts preaching to you. (laughs) One of the busiest airports in the world, Atlanta airport, and we were sitting there, and preacher, I'm watching people as they just move, and everybody is going somewhere. Everybody's moving. Everybody's hurrying. Everybody is so laser focused on where they are. And I, it dawned on me that every person in that airport was going somewhere. They had a destination outside of the airport. You don't just go to an airport just to hang out with people. You don't go just to eat at one of their little restaurants there. Everybody that was in that airport was going somewhere. Can I stop long enough and say this? Every person in this room is going somewhere. There are only two destinations for eternity. There is no middle ground. There's no getting off place. There's two destinations, and that is heaven and that is hell. And I want to challenge this church this morning that we should get ready to miss hell and make our final destination heaven. But I watched people, there were businessmen in that airport, and man, they seemed like they just got everything together. They've done that before. They were ready. They had their bags packed perfectly. They knew exactly where their gates was. I watched these men. As you could tell, they had done this before. They had, they, it was a daily routine for them to go to the airport, get on a plane, and fly out to a destination. And so they seemed like they had everything in order. And then there was people at the airport that's like my people. I told you I've got two daughters and a wife, four, and then somebody else travels with us, my niece travels with us sometimes, four females traveling with me. There's some people, yes, God bless me big time. There's some people, businessmen, that have everything prepared. We show up at the airport, and I'm just praying we got all of our bags. I'm looking around just making sure that we hadn't left our littlest one at the house. We're just trying to get everything together, and it seems so disorganized trying to get all of our stuff. Now, that's one thing to live like that traveling here But I do not want to be the person that is at the last minute trying to find all my stuff when Jesus comes back. I want to be a man that is prepared to leave this place. This morning, I want to preach from this thought real quickly. I'm going to give it to you. This is something God gave me in that airport. And I want to preach to you on this. Living like you are leaving. We all, every day, somebody ought to help me preach it right here. Every day we should live our lives like we're leaving here. I don't want people to look at me and it seems like I've got my tent pegs stuck so deep in the ground here that I'm not getting ready to go there. But I want people to look at my life and realize he's on his way somewhere. He's going somewhere. God's got a bigger plan. God's got a bigger purpose. He's not living for this world, but he's living for another world called heaven. That's how I want to do that. In order to live like you're leaving, you have got to make the preparations. You have got to be prepared. And every person in here this morning should make those preparations. You can get, did you know you can get ready today for when God comes back? We don't know the hour nor the day. He could come back tonight and I want to make sure that I've got everything in order. I want to make sure that my children are ready. I want to make sure that my wife is ready. I want to make sure that everybody that is wanting to be in my life throughout eternity, that they're ready to go and I want to make sure the preparations are made. In order to make the preparations for living like you're leaving, first of all, 
You've got to make this preparation. You've got to reserve your seat. You have got to reserve your seat for the flight for heaven. What does that mean? That means you've got to have a ticket. You can't show up at the airport in Atlanta today and just show up flippantly and say, you know what, I think I'm going to take a flight today. Y'all let me on one of them planes. And they say, oh, you look like a good person. You come on, we got a seat just for you. That's not how it works. Do you know how you make a reservation with the airline? Before you ever get to the airport, before you ever bring and pack your bags and check your bags in, you have got to contact the airline and let them know that you want to take a flight with them. You have got to reserve your seat. It's the same way in God's economy. You can't just wait till he comes back and say, Hey, God, I tried to live a good life. I tried to do what's right. I want to go to heaven too. No, before he ever comes back, you have got to make the preparations today and make sure that you are ready. How do you do that? You've got to contact God. You've got to contact heaven. You've got to call on his name. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're not getting in by your good deeds. You're not getting in just because your grandma went to heaven and your grandma was a member of this church. You have got to personally get a ticket with your name on it. Every person must reserve their seat. I found it amazing that just because me and my wife are going on a flight, that don't mean that my kids get to go. I have got to make a personal reservation with the airline to make sure they have a seat too. It is a personal reservation that each and every one of us have to make. There may be somebody, listen, I don't know y'all. I, I told them in this morning, y'all look so sanctimonious, just beautiful this morning. You look like you just got everything going on like Donkey Kong. Everything's good in your life. You just got all the pieces together. But I have found out that what we're good at is faking in front of everybody. But you can't fake anything at your house because the people that live with you know who you really are. And the truth of the matter is, is you can fool me. And you can fool all them, but you can't fool God. God knows whether or not. I've I've preached in churches for a long time now, and I'm amazed to see how people who sit in religion think that they've done good enough to get them into heaven. It's not going to be your good deeds that get you there. You have got to make a reservation with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say your good deeds are going to do it. He didn't say that it's going to be because you were associated with people that was going to heaven. He didn't say because you was a member of a class or you was a member of the right church. I want to tell you something. Only a relationship, personal contact with Jesus Christ will get you there. You say, preacher, how do I reserve my ticket for heaven? You've got to fall on your knees and you've got to tell God, listen, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be left here when you come back. I want to make my calling and election sure. I want to make my reservation today. It's not my good deeds I've failed. I've sinned but it's only what you did on the cross called Calvary that will get me into heaven. God will not look you in the face when you stand before him and ask what kind of education did you have. He will not ask you how much money did you have in your bank account. He will not look you in the eyes and ask you was your mama a good mama or your daddy a good daddy. No, what he will say to you is what did you do with my son that I gave you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. The only way we get to heaven, the only way we get a ticket is by going through Jesus Christ the Son. Now let me ask you a question. Have you made your reservation? Have you reserved your seat? If you have, say amen. Amen. You ought to get more happy than you are about it. I know it's Sunday morning. But you ought to get real happy that you made your... You know what that reservation means? (laughs) Ain't nobody can take your seat. Whoop, hallelujah. Reservation. First, you must make a reservation. You've got to reserve your seat. But secondly, watch this. If we're going to live like we're leaving, we not only can have to reserve our seat, but we've got to release our baggage. 
I figured I'd get a few more amens than that. I'm about to come down to where y'all sitting in a minute. You've got, if you're going to live like you're leaving, you've got to be able to release your bags. I find it amazing. Preacher, the very first thing that you do when you get to the airport, how many of you have flown before? Wave at me. The very first thing you do when you get to the airport is not go find your gate. The very first thing you do is not go find where Starbucks is. What is the very first thing you do when you get to the door? Check your bags. Somebody flown before. Isn't it amazing that the airport asks you to the very first thing you do? It's not go find out who your pilot is. not go find out where the gate is. It's not go find out how the layout of the airport. But the very first thing they ask you to do is give us your bags. They don't expect you to carry your own bags on the plane. You know why? Because they know people are traveling with females. <laughs> now, some of y'all ladies are already mad at me. <laughs> But I travel for a living, and I understand. I know if anybody knows anything about baggage, the evangelist this morning knows about baggage. Because them women come with a lot of it. They call it accessories. My daughters have baggage just for their bows on their head. Because they've got to have a bow. I don't know if some of you ladies are the same way, but my wife, she has to have a bow that not only matches the outfit, but it matches the season as well. <laughs> it's got to coordinate with all uh, of the solar system of heaven in order for everything's got to be right. And so there's just so much. And you know what? They know that if I had to try to get to my gate with all of my stuff, trying to carry all my bags through the airport that I might not make it. The very first thing that you do when you get to the airport, when you're leaving for a trip, is release your bags. And then if an airport expects you to do that, how many of us walked in this morning carrying our baggage? Now, nobody knows it because you can't see what you've been carrying, but you know it's there. It's wearing you out trying to carry all that stuff from where you came from. And you know what Jesus said? He said, come unto me, greatest invitation ever. Come unto me, all ye that labor. I don't know why I'm spending so much time over here. I feel like somebody needs to hear it. <laughs> I feel it. Feel it right there. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I'll give you. You know what that is? God's saying, give me your bags. You cannot get to your gate like you need to get to your gate if all you're doing is carrying your baggage. Have you ever tried to get on one of them planes? Have you ever sat in one of them seats? They don't give you a whole lot of room to live. Can you imagine if they expected you to get all your bags on there? Aren't you glad that the airline makes a way where once you drop it off at the door, you don't have to worry about it no more? <laughs> That's how God wants you to live. He wants you to check, see in that bag. Listen, that's a uniform bag. It's zipped up and it looks like everything's together. But if you open that bag, you would find out that there's compartments upon compartments in there. There's zippers that is zipping up. And all of the stuff in here is not organized. And all this stuff in here is not together. And just be honest with you, I don't know where else to put it. So I put it in this compartment and I zip it up. And I zip it up real tight just to make sure. But I want to tell you something. I don't know where else everything goes and it's weighing me down. It's the same thing with your life. There's many of us that we look on the outside like we've got it all together and we've zipped up our life when we come to church. But if people could see what was taking place on the inside, they would realize that there's disarray. They would realize that there's uh, 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 chaos. They would realize that there's bitterness. They would realize that there's bruises and burdens and we don't know how to get through this and we don't know how to get rid of it and we're just carrying it and it's wearing us out but God said give it to me I'll get it to your destination I know what to do with it this morning somebody 
has walked in here carrying your bags. But if you're going to live like you're leaving, it's time to check your bags at the door. God can take that stuff from you. Our marriages are wearing out because we're carrying baggage. Our children are wore out because they're carrying baggage. Our churches can't worship right, can't walk right, can't live and witness right because we're carrying baggage. Stuff you're carrying with you from where you came, you need to check at the door. Release your bags. If you're going to live like you're leaving, you've got to release your bags. You've got to reserve your seat. But watch this. Let me give you a third one. I'm almost done. Somebody say amen. You've got to rely on your help. When I walked on that airline, or I walked on that airplane, me- meeting me at the door was this lady. She opened the door to me. And she said, come on in. Big smile on her face. She said, welcome aboard. Delta Airline, thank you for joining us. She looked at me and she said, do you, do you know where your seat is? I said, no, ma'am, I, I've never been on this plane before. All, all, all I know is it says I'm in 36J. I don't know where that's, that's at. She said, don't you worry about it. I'll take you right to your seat. And that woman walked me down the aisle and took me to the exact place where I was supposed to sit down. She looked at me and she said this. She said, Mr. Carr, if you need anything at all, you just let us know. And she said, in mid-flight, if the uh, uh, buckle seat belt light is on, just you don't have to get up. You don't have to come find me. She said, but if you need anything at all, if you'll just look above your head, there is a button just above your head. You just press that button and I'll come to your seat and find out what you need, anything at all you need. I'll get it for you. She said, we're going to be coming by in a little bit. We've got refreshments we're going to give to you. She said, you just sit down and enjoy your flight. I said, if I need you, I just got to hit that button above my head. She said, that button above your head, just hit it and I'll come find you. You don't have to come find me. I said, that button right there. She said, that button right there. She said, you have a good day. She walked off. I looked at that button. I looked at her. I looked back at that button and I hit it. She turned around. She said, you need something? I said, no, I just wanted to check and see if you'd do what you said you'd do. She said, anything you need, you just let me know. Just look up and hit that button. Child of God, I want to tell you something. God did not leave us here hopeless. God did not leave us here through this life just to find our own way. But any time that we need him, he said he will send a comforter. He will send the Holy Ghost of God that will be our guide. He will be our help. He will be our refreshment. He'll be what we need. And listen, you ain't got to call his name out. You don't have to go find him. All you got to do is look up and hit the button of prayer and Jesus will send the Holy Spirit of God to be your help. Every now and then I've been dry. Every now and then I've been hungry and I didn't know what to do. I'd reach up in prayer and hit the call help button and the Holy Spirit of God would blow through my life and he'd refresh me and he would feed me and he'd revive me. That's the Holy Spirit of God. If you're happy that God sent a help in the Holy Spirit, give God praise. You say, why you act the way you do? I'm trying to figure out why you ain't. A God like that is so worthy of our praise that he didn't leave us here helpless. You sit there and you wonder, why can't I shout like I used to? Why can't I feel God like I used to? You feel dry. Hold on, honey. He's coming with refreshments just for you. You say, I don't know where to turn. I'd unbuckle and I'd get up and go try to find my help, but I don't know where to go. Just look up this morning and hit God's call help button. I was in a meeting in Charlotte. I'll tell you this story and I'll move on. I'll be finished. I was in a meeting in Charlotte, and there was a man sitting there, big guy, tattoos all over his arms. During the service, we was preaching, and we was singing and giving God praise. And I was trying to serve God the best I could, just witness for him, and let everybody know that God's in control. I mentioned that statement about 
Somebody just needs to reach up and hit God's call help button. I said, you need to release what you got in your hands and just look up and hit God's call help button. My wife can testify to it. People was in the altars. People getting right. Had a young lady got saved that night. After the service, this big guy come walking up to me. And I was saying, dear Jesus, please. Please, God, don't let me have said something that make that man mad. In Jesus' name, please. He walked up to me with tears in his eyes. Hugged me, bear hugged me, picked me up off the ground. And he said, you don't know how you saved my life tonight. I said, I didn't do it. He did it. He said, my wife can testify, this boy was in a rival gang. God had saved him. And the gang members had been coming by his house threatening him. He said, I went and picked up, I've been in jail, and a friend of mine went and got me a gun. I went and picked it up today. He said, I was on my way to that man's house because I was tired of all the threats. I was on my way to that man's house, and we was going to duke it out. One of us would have been left for dead. And he said, and the preacher texted me a message and said, you was going to be here on Tuesday night. And so I decided to come to the revival. He said, but I had in my mind I was going to go by that man's house after it was over with. He said, tonight God told me I need to drop the gun and just hit the button. God is our only hope. God is our only help. Listen. If I can't call him and him come help, I'm in trouble. But I'm glad that he's never denied one child in desperate need of him. He is all we need. (laughs) Rely on your help. If you're going to live like you're leaving, you've got to release your bags. You've got to reserve your seat. And lastly, <laughs> you got to remember who your pilot is. Rely on your help, reserve your seat, relief, release your baggage, but remember who your pilot is. When I got on that plane, preacher, I walked on and the door was shut to where the pilot was. I found it amazing that I had never met this man, that I'm putting my life in his hands. I had, ha- I had absolute faith that when I sat in my seat, that pilot in the driver's seat knew exactly what he was doing. Now, I'm be honest with you. I'm glad that the airline didn't leave it up to me to find my own pilot. But when I got my ticket, guess what came with it? The pilot. Of the flight. I didn't have to go find my own pilot. I'm glad that it was not a requirement that I knew how to fly the plane when I got on board. Because if it was up to me, we'd all been in trouble. I could have never gotten that plane. I don't know what all them instruments do. I don't know what all them buttons do. And there was no way that I could get that plane off the tarmac, much less could I ever get it in the air and land it safely. I'm glad that they didn't depend on me when I got on board for me to know how to fly that plane. But I had absolute faith that the man in the cockpit knew what he was doing. Can I tell you something? I had absolute faith that that man could get me to my destination. He could get me to where I was going. But the door was shut when I got on the plane and I didn't get to see his face. I got in my seat and I sat there and I started thinking, I'm putting my entire life in the hands of a man that I hadn't even seen his face yet. I don't even know who he is. I don't know anything about his background, but I have enough faith to put my life in his hands. People say you're crazy to trust a God that you've never seen, but yet they'll get on a plane and they'll fly with a man that they've never seen. I want to tell you something. It takes faith to 
believe that the man in the cockpit knows what he's doing. I couldn't have got to my destination. I couldn't take me where we needed to go. But I had enough faith to believe that that man could get me to my destination. He could get me where I needed to go. Every now and then, I would feel that plane rev up and the engine would rev up and I'd look out my window and I'd see those jet engines that was on both sides of that plane and I'd see them as they'd rev up. Then I'd see as that, that the wings of that plane, the flaps on the wings would go up and down. You say, what was happening? That pilot was getting us ready to taxi off of the runway. He was revving up the engine. He was working out the flaps just to make sure everything was ready. How do you know God exists? Because every now and then I'll get in a church like this and a man will get up and sing, oh, what a Savior. And I'll feel like God is putting the pedal to the metal and he's revving up the engine. He's working out the flaps and we're getting ready to taxi off the runway and we're getting ready to head to a place called heaven. Every now and then, I feel God rev this thing up. What's happening in our world? God is getting ready to taxi off of this runway. Flying through the air. There was turbulence. I remember when we flew to San Antonio, we went by way of Dallas and and there was a storm that was over Houston and as we was coming around all of a sudden while we're flying I, 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 I did not see my pilot's uh, face I, I didn't know what he looked like but all of a sudden over the intercom I heard his voice and he said ladies and gentlemen we're about to surface some turbulence if you'll sit down buckle your seat belts he said I'm going to try to get us around the storm I'm going to try to get us through the storm I'm going to try to get us above the storm and when I heard his voice though I did not see his face I put my trust that he knew what he was doing child of God I may not have seen my pilot's face I may not have seen my captain's face but I've heard his voice and I know that everything's going to be (laughs) alright He got us through that turbulence. And I remember looking out and there were storm clouds around us when we started our journey. But then he took off. I'm talking about, I don't know how you say it, in the aeronautical business, but he put the pedal to the metal and all of a sudden we started rising a little higher and a little higher and lightning that used to be around us was now under us and all the clouds that used to be over us was now under us. And I looked out on the horizon and I could see the sun coming up on on the other side and I said I believe that he did what he say he did he would do I'm glad that the captain knows how to get us above the noise of the storm we landed that plane and I was just thanking God to be alive and all of a sudden I'm finished all of a sudden brother y'all come on up and get ready for an invitation all of a sudden that door that was shut watch this The door that was shut when I got on, (laughs) it opened up. (laughs) Out steps this distinguished looking man, hat in his hand under his arm. And he was greeting everybody as they got off the plane. And I looked up there and I'm checking him out. And he's standing up there with a big smile on his face. And we get closer to him and I'm thinking in my mind, man, I want to say something to him. And, and it dawned on me that I did not get to see his face when I got on. But when I was about to get off, I was going to get to see his face. Child of God, you may not have seen his face when you got in this thing. But when you land safely on the other side, you're going to get to see the face of the one that is the captain of our salvation. I walked up to him. I saw him and looked him eye to eye. Yeah, somebody ought to give God praise that we're going to see him one day face to face. I said, I want to say something to him. Katie said, don't embarrass us. I said, I want to say something to him. I I want to tell him thank you. And I'm going in my mind. And I'm from South Carolina. I don't know a whole lot. I'm not educated in the greatest universities, I'll be honest with you. And I started thinking, I want to tell him something like your aeronautical abilities. 
and skills just supersede all the things of this world and just uh, uh, beyond all the atmosphere of this life. And I thought, that just sounds stupid. As I got to him, I don't know where it came from. I don't know how it happened. (laughs) But just looked straight at him, big smile on his face. And as I got up to him, all my words left me. And I looked at him and I did that right there. (laughs) He smiled, looked back at me. He did that right there. I got off that plane. I'm walking through the airport. My my face is lit up and I'm sitting there shaking my head. Katie said, what's wrong with you? I said, you see what he did? He didn't do that to nobody else. He did it to me. She said, what did he do? I said, I just told him thank you. And he looked back at me and said, you're welcome. I don't know how heaven's going to be. I'd love to think that I'd bow on my knees, clap my hands, and a thousand times over say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd love to think that I'd bow at his feet, kiss those nail-pierced feet, just tell him you didn't have to, but thank you. I'd love to look him in his face, see the crowns where they pierced his brow, So you didn't have to. But thank you for getting my family safe to the other side. I don't know what words I'll say if I say any. But if all I got in me is that right there. And I see him smile and look at me and do that right there. I'll know what he means. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to your final destination. When I think of things like that, and I hear songs like, oh, what a Savior. It makes me want to live like I'm leaving. How many of you this morning, I, I don't know how you normally do it, but I wonder if you'd stand to your feet. Maybe somebody wants to come and get around an altar. And just tell him thank you. If you don't want to come here, maybe in your seat, you want to just turn around and tell him thank you. Thank you that you love me that much that you let me on board. Heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm finished, I'm done. I wonder, is there anybody in here this morning and say, Preacher, I know without a doubt I'm saved. I don't doubt it a bit. I know I'm saved. But I've got some baggage and stuff that I need God to deal with right now. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up real high? Hands going up everywhere. Don't be ashamed of it. Truth of the matter is, is we all are bringing something with us. I wonder right where you stand, this altar is open. They told me we could use it. So if you want to come use it, let the altar alter your life. If you raised your hand, won't you come and just release your bags? Reach up in prayer and hit that button. That's it. Come on. Maybe you want to bring your wife or your husband with you. Maybe you got some baggage in your marriage you need to let go of. We've all got something we need to release to Him. All of us should tell Him thank you. I'll ask one more question and I'll take my seat. Is there anybody in here this morning say, Preacher, I couldn't raise my hand and say, I know I'm saved because I don't know. Preacher, I'm going to be honest with you. Because I like people being honest with me. I'm going to shoot straight with you. Nobody looking around. Preacher, if I died today, I do not know that I'm going to heaven. 
but I know I don't want to go to hell. If that's you in here this morning, nobody looking around, just me and the preacher. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? I'm not coming to you and embarrassing you. I just want to know, is that you, preacher? I don't know that I'm saved, but I know I don't want to go to hell. Would you throw your hand up put it right back down? Just put it up, put it right back down. In the middle, there was one. Thank you. Is there another? Nobody looking around. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to pray for you. That's it. Pray for me, preacher. I don't know that I'm saved, but I know I don't want to go to hell. The one that raised their hand, maybe there were others. I promise you, I'm taking my seat. I'm going to get out of the way. But I want to talk to you for just one second. If I brought Jesus to your seat, And I introduced you to him. I called your name out. And said, Jesus, this is whatever your name is. And he reached out his nail-pierced hand. Would you reach out and take his? And like you would a friend... Would you invite him into your heart like you would somebody into your home? You say, preacher, that's me. I would do that. If Jesus would take me like I am, I'll take him like he is. This morning, I would do that. If that's you, I want you to bow your head. And I want you to talk to him. He said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Confession is made with the mouth. Belief is made in the heart. Just say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I admit it. I admit it. I've sinned. I've messed up. Lord, I'm a sinner, but I heard you're a Savior. Are you praying it? This morning, I invite you into my heart. Jesus, wash me Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, talk to him. Save me. Pray it. Thank you for dying for me so that I could live. From this day forward, I'll do everything I can to live for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, don't be ashamed of him. But would you just slip your hand up just so I can know, preacher, I prayed with you. I did. I prayed with you. Thank you, honey. I appreciate that. Thank you. There's another one. Is there another? Is there? Thank you, honey. I appreciate it right here in the middle. Is there another? There's one back there. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Church, give God praise.